Brethren, we're very happy to have our brother Albert and sister Anastasia's Anastasia with us. This was home to them for many, many years. And many of us can reflect back on the many rich blessings we received from our fellowship together in the past and brother Albert's ministry to us as an elder of our ecclesia for my so many years I can't hardly remember. <laughs> So we're looking forward to receiving a blessing. <clears throat> and Brother Albert has chosen for his subject the five parables of the Gospel of John. The five parables of the Gospel of John. Brother Albert. As has been announced, we thought we might consider this evening the five parables of the Gospel of John. And as an opening text, we'll use John, uh, John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In a comparative study of the four Gospels, we find that the Gospel according to John is different from the other three in many ways. All four of the Gospels relate things that Jesus said and the things that he did during his earthly ministry. Yet we find that the things that are recorded in the Gospel of John are rarely touched on or very slightly touched, and most of it is not touched at all by the other three Gospel writers. In the Oxford Cyclopedic Concordance, if any of you have that in the back of your Bible, there's a complete list of all the parables in the Gospels, in the Gospels that are, that are written by Mark, by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, there's nothing mentioned about John. You know, at first, we thought it might have been an oversight because the word parable is used in the gospel according to John and yet this list does not include any parables in the gospel according to John. <clears throat> and so that, of course, uh, rose the question as to why. Why would any compiler who supposedly would have been an authority on what the Bible contains would not mention anything about a parable or parables in the Gospel according to John. And when we consider the parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they show the various phases of the kingdom in its development and also in its completion. Many of the parables begin with the statement, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto, or the kingdom of God is likened unto. But in John's gospel, the parables do not show the kingdom is likened unto. The parables in John only show the relationship between Jesus and his body members, the church. And so we'd like to consider the five parables that John did record and see how completely they speak of only the relationship between Jesus and the church and do not cover the, the development of the church or its final completion. These are uh, found, or the order that they are found, we'll mention them now. The first one is the water of life, and that is found in John 4, verses 5 through 15. The second parable is the bread of life, and that's found in John 6, verses 32 to 35. The third one is the parable of the good shepherd, and it is found in John 10, verses 1 through 16. The fourth one is the parable of many mansions. 
And this is John 14, verses 1 through 3. And the fifth and last is the parable of the vine and the branches in John 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, each of the parables have a general lesson, and all of them deal with our relationship to our head and master. In the first and second of these parables, our Lord here is shown as providing for his church, the water of life and the bread of life. And of course, these are the basic requirements in the natural sense for our nourishment and growth. But in the spiritual sense, it is that which is provided for us as new creatures in Christ Jesus that we might grow from babes into mature Christians. <coughs> In the parable of the Good Shepherd, we are shown that we cannot direct ourselves, but as natural sheep need a shepherd to direct them, and our Lord is our shepherd. In the parable of the many mansions, it gives us a goal or objective to our lives that will, when we have been proved faithful, and finished our earthly course, we are prepared for, we have prepared for us by our Lord a mansion, and this mansion is immortality. Now the parable of the vine and branches, we are shown that we as the branches must remain in our Lord the vine for our continual existence and growth in Christ, because outside of him there is no life for us. Now we'd like to go over these parables one at a time and draw a few lessons. The parable of the water of life, I'm sure that most of you can recall the time when Jesus and his disciples came into Samaria, and uh, the disciples went into the town to buy some food. And Jesus sat at the edge of the well, and a Samaritan woman, woman came to him, and then they had quite a lengthy conversation. And it wasn't normal for the Jews to have much to do with the uh, Samaritans. The Samaritans were a people that uh, were brought in by the Assyrians and the Babylonians to take care of the land when the Jews were removed from it. And also some of the Jews that were not uh, faithful, some have called them renegade Jews, intermarried with the Samaritans. And since the Jews were moved out of Samaria, these Samaritans accepted the God of Israel. And since Israel was not in the land, they assumed that they had replaced them in, as God's favorites. And the Jews generally would not accept their claim as having replaced them, nor would they accept them as being equal with themselves. And so as a result of that, there was an enmity <coughs> between the Jews and the Samaritans, even though the Samaritans claimed that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were their fathers. And in this parable of the water of life, Jesus asked the Samaritan woman for a drink of water. And then he, <clears throat> he told her that he could give her living water. And of course she was completely taken aback. He had nothing to bring up the water with. And so she inquired further, and then later she asked him, Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Because this well that they were sitting at, or conversing at, 
was the well of Jacob, which was in Samaria. So that the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, so that the Lord, in speaking to her, led her on to a realization that here was one who could understand, he could read even her, or he could tell her about her previous life. And she mentioned her husband, and our Lord said, but the one you are living with is not your husband. And, uh, of course, we can well imagine the woman's surprise that anybody would tell her that without having been informed by anyone, having met her for the first time. And that Jesus promised her that if, if she could accept it, he could give her living water. Living water that would quench her thirst so that she would not need any further water. He was speaking figuratively. She was thinking literally. And she was thinking that he could somehow give her water, that literal water, that it wouldn't be necessary for her to come back to the well at any other time. But <clears throat> he was speaking about the spiritual water that he would bring to all peoples and um, in due time. Now, he, <clears throat> in this parable, she was uh, she was concerned and asked if she could uh, be provided with this water. And I think the Lord was preparing her heart and mind, and even though she was not a virtuous woman, nevertheless, our Lord saw something in her that he prepared her, even though at the time she wasn't able, nor would the Lord accept her because she was a Gentile but that she was prepared that in due time when the Gentiles were accepted into the body of Christ, she could have been accepted. And that those of us who have accepted our Lord as our water of life, he has quenched our thirst so we no longer look for other truths or other ideas nor are we looking for any other philosophies or any other pursuits in life. In the next parable, the parable of the bread of life, as we mentioned, it was in John 6, verses 32 to 35. This was given shortly after the miraculous feeding of 5,000. And he fed 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two small fishes. And the intent of the parable was to divert them from the provisions of the natural bread to the Father's provision of the bread from heaven. And also our Lord said that many of them who followed and came and listened to his, his parables that they came for the fishes and the loaves that he provided, the literal fishes and loaves. But our Lord's parable was not to stress the natural bread, but rather the bread from heaven, the bread from heaven that would fully satisfy and for all eternity, that he was the bread of life, that he would provide his own perfect human nature that would satisfy not only the church during the gospel age, but it would be sufficient for the blessing of the whole world of mankind. The worldly people today are satisfied with earthly things, and they don't have much inclination towards heavenly things. And we have a problem as being in the flesh that there is a natural tendency for our human nature to lean towards earthly things. And we must, by the Lord's grace, to appreciate more the heavenly things, the heavenly bread, 
rather than the earthly things, the earthly bread. And we have found that the more that our desires are for heavenly things, it diminishes our desire for earthly things. And so in our endeavors, our considerations, our um, efforts to please the Lord, we find that it's necessary to subdue our natural desires, our fleshly desires, so that we might be more inclined to accept the heavenly things. The parable of the Good Shepherd, found in John 10, verses 1 through 16, we're not reading these for trying to save time. Now in this lesson of the parable, the Lord speaks of himself as being the door of the sheep, the door by which the sheep enter into the true sheepfold. Now our Lord, as the shepherd, said among other things that his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. And I'm sure that all of us who have come to the Lord in full consecration have heard the shepherd's voice and we came to him. When we think of it in that way, we realize that it takes unusual ability to hear the master's voice as our shepherd from all the other voices in the world. And there are many that come to our attention continually. And not only is it necessary that we hear the shepherd's voice at the beginning, initially, but that we keep our hearts and minds tuned that we might continue to hear the shepherd's voice and not be misled by other voices that would divert us from our shepherd. And this is a necessity for us through all our Christian walk. Now, the human mind is a very peculiar thing. And I'm sure that we're aware of the fact that the human mind can accept the most ridiculous things, the most unreasonable things, as people have done and continue to do. So it all depends on our heart condition. We must be in tune with our shepherd. Our heart must be fixed on righteousness, on truth, endeavoring to do the Lord's will to the extent that we possibly can, because if our hearts begin to wander, or they begin to look for something new or additional. The Lord may permit us to find it. We were told of a brother, and his son said, you know, the trouble with my dad is that he read too many commentaries, commentaries written by religious leaders. These people did not understand the plan, but they had comments on practically every text. But these comments would not be in harmony with the divine plan. They would be thoughts that would be contrary to it. And if we permit ourselves to look into these, we might be affected by them to the extent that we would lose the understanding of the plan and instead accept these views of these various religious writers. And many of them have a double D behind their name prominent. They're men that are looked up to in religious circles, but they do not understand God's plan. And so, above all things, we must watch our hearts and minds that we do not permit our hearts to wander away from the truth, or that we would get tired of the divine plan of the ages and begin looking for something different, something original, something that the other brethren don't know anything about. And we find supposedly pearls of knowledge that might lead us away from the Lord and his truth. And so each one of us must watch our own hearts and minds to watch that we are in tune with our good shepherd. You know, our Lord in that parable mentioned that there would be 
thieves and robbers that would enter in among the sheep. Now, since he mentioned it as something that would happen, I think it's only logical to, to conclude that that must have happened, that there have been those that have been thieves and robbers amongst the Lord's people down through the gospel age that didn't come in to help the sheep according to our shepherd's direction, but to bring them away from the shepherd for their own ends, to lead them away from the good shepherd's voice and plan and service to serve men and organizations. The next parable, the parable of many mansions found in John 14, verses 1 to 3, this parable was given shortly after Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples, after he had given the sop to Judas, and Judas had gone out to betray him. This parable was given after telling the disciples that they would be offended that night because of him. And he told Peter that Peter would deny him thrice before the cock crew. It is reasonable to suppose that the hearts of the eleven were very heavy at the time, that they were disturbed, and they couldn't understand what the Lord was speaking about. These things that he was saying had upset their equilibrium. They had decided only five days earlier that he was about to set up his kingdom. Now he was talking about his death. He was talking about leaving them. And it seems as though this parable was given to encourage them to hold on, not to give up their faith, not to begin to doubt whether he was the promised Messiah. And so he gave this parable to help them. Well, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now in the first statement that our Lord made, he said that they believed in God. They believed in his heavenly Father, they trusted in God even before they met our Lord. And he's encouraging them, if they did believe in God, believe in me also. This is not a fraud of any kind, a misrepresentation. And he said that in his father's house were many mansions. And I think the mansions refer to the planes of being. No, we believe from the scriptures that there are myriads of angelic hosts, various grades, seraphims, cherubims, powers, and perhaps there are others. So there are myriads of angels on various levels. And our Lord is here promising his followers that he was to go and prepare a place for them not the place that other angelic beings were on, but rather a new mansion, a mansion that was not yet in existence. And we believe that this mansion was the divine nature, and he would be the first to receive that. And that he also told them that he would prepare this place for them, and that he would return again. And then, at that time, he would receive them to himself, that where I am, there ye may be also. It undoubtedly was a great comfort to them at that time. Undoubtedly, it was a great comfort to them during all of their earthly pilgrimage. And it has been a great comfort to all of the Lord's people down through the age that when the Lord would return, he would raise his sleeping saints and bring them up to the divine nature, bring them up to the nature that he himself possesses. I don't know how it is with most of you. I'm inclined to think that you probably have the same problem I have, that when we begin to speak about the divine nature, 
we get lost. I lack words to try to describe what it's like. I lack for my own benefit. I can't describe adequately for myself what that really is. From the scriptures we gather that it's something far beyond anything that we know, anything we've heard of, anything we've seen. But in detail, we don't know. It's something that transcends even our imagination to have the ability. We understand that the divine nature has intuitive knowledge. Well, intuitive knowledge is knowledge that arrives at a conclusion without the process of reasoning. The problem is presented to one that has intuitive knowledge and they have the answer immediately without the process of considering now. This happened, and this happened, and this happened, and therefore this is the proper conclusion. That is not necessary for one who has intuitive knowledge. Also, what is the beauty of the divine nature? It's represented by gold, the most beautiful of all our metals. And I would guess, and I say guess because I can't describe it for you, that it would have to be something beyond our conception. The beauty that our Heavenly Father and our Lord now possess in all of our brethren who have passed on before us. When I stop to think if and when I were to be received into their presence, I guess that the scene would have to be so striking. It would have to be something that it would just be beyond anything that I knew or expected. It would be something that would just overawe myself, at least for a while, to think this would be so far superior to anything that we know of. Now a divine being, you know, we know something about the abilities of a human, and some have unusual abilities, but the ability of a divine being, none of us could describe. None of us have the slightest idea what a divine being could do, what he's able to do, how far-reaching is his ability. So when I begin thinking of this mansion that the Lord is preparing for his people, that those are the brethren that have gone before us and those who will yet receive that reward, that it must have been more than overawing, that it must have been something that, regardless of their concept, that it must far exceed anything that they thought it might be. And the Lord did not really describe it for us. You know, the Apostle John tried to tell us what it would be like. You know, the best he could do was, we shall be like him, or we shall see him as he is. And he couldn't go any further than that in trying to convey to us what this really would amount to, what it would consist of, what effect it would have on us, and what we would be able to do by the Lord's providence then, over and beyond anything that we could do today. Our Heavenly Father, in His mercy, has provided for the selection of the Bride of Christ. And it has taken over 1,900 years, and we believe that this Bride of Christ is not yet complete. And if we could only appreciate more and would strive with greater diligence that we might be among those who would be so favored as to receive the divine nature. The last of the five parables is the parable of the vine and the branches. And it's found in John 15, verses 1 through 11. We'd like to read these verses. And it reads, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he pruneth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in a vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. 
I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye may ask what ye will, that it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that he bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This parable, we believe, was given following the Memorial Supper, the last day of our Lord's earthly ministry, and that he was trying to encourage them what they must do if they are to be faithful. We have a number of thoughts presented here that our Lord pictures himself as a vine, the stem of the vine, and his church as branches in the vine, and that each branch needs pruning. And pruning, we believe, would picture the trials, the tests, the disciplines that the Lord finds necessary for us that we might bear fruit. Knowing the truth is not enough. Knowledge in itself is merely an end, a means to an end. The end of all of our Christian walk is bearing fruit fruit acceptable to the Lord, the fruits and graces of the Spirit. Our Heavenly Father, as Jesus said here, my Father is the husbandman. Now the husbandman is the one who takes care of the vines. He's the one that prunes the vines so that they would bear the maximum amount of fruitage. The natural tendency of the vine is go to wood making. That is, it grows a larger vine. The natural tendency is not towards fruit bearing. And so the husbandman must continually keep trimming, must continually keep cutting off what are described as suckers, those branches that would not produce fruit, but merely take life from the, from the vine, merely for the purpose of growing. And so the Lord, in his dealing with us as branches in the vine, gives us a variety of experiences. Some we find, or most of them, contrary to our natural inclinations. Things that we would rather do otherwise naturally. But our Lord is pruning, through the various experiences, pruning us to bear fruit, the fruits of the Spirit. Our Lord tells us in this parable, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now it doesn't read that the Lord will grant us whatever we ask. There's a condition. If ye abide in me, if we are being directed by the Lord, if we're trying to, as he said, and my words abide in you, if you're being directed by the Lord's word, trying to do his will to as great an extent as you can. And this again, we're not trying to convey the thought that any of us will be able to do perfectly in the flesh. But there is a standard that we must all reach, and that is, we must intend to do perfectly. And each one of the Lord's people must reach that standard of desiring to do perfectly. Today and tomorrow and the day after and every day 
of our life. That no one will receive the full reward who does not reach that point in their lives where they want to do the Lord's will perfectly. And at the end of each day, we have an advocate with the Father. We come to him and ask him to forgive us for that which we had failed in, that which we had come short in through the merit of our dear Redeemer. And our Lord tells us in this parable that herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, not just a little, but much, as much as we possibly can. In one place, Brother Russell said, and I fully believe it, that each one of the Lord's people will be tested to the uttermost. And when you stop to think of it, to the uttermost, that means tested completely, to the point that there is no question about our faithfulness, our devotion to the Lord, our desire to do His will only, and not let anything else swerve us from this. Or we might put it differently and say that it is our desire to fulfill our consecration vow as fully and as completely as we possibly can. The Lord will not accept half measures. He will not accept if we say, well, I'll do it part of the time, but there are exceptions. There are no exceptions. In our consecration vow, we did not say to the Lord, I'll do your will, except anyone who approaches our Heavenly Father in their consecration and makes reservations, I think it is safe to say that the Lord would not accept that consecration. He only wants full and complete devotion to do His will as we discern it along the Christian way. I think it's also true that as we continue in the way, that we should understand more clearly what our Father's will for us and strive with all that is within us to do it. Our Lord also told us that as the Father had loved Him, so He loved us. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, not only knowing what the Lord's commandments are for us, but the doing of his commandments. If ye keep my commandments, if ye do these things, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So here Jesus is giving us the formula for his success, that it was his keeping of his heavenly Father's commandments that brought from his heavenly Father his love for him. Now this is likewise true of us, that if we would keep his commandments, he would also love us. We'd have the same relationship as he. And that these things were given to us, that our joy might remain in us and that our joy may be full. And this joy that is spoken of here is the joy of knowing and doing our Heavenly Father's will, that the earthly things are delusions. You know, the brethren sometimes are led astray by earthly ambitions, earthly hopes and ambitions and so on. You know, we've reached a time in human history when many of mankind know nothing about the divine plan. are beginning to realize that these earthly things are very much like illusions. You might have them today and lose them tomorrow. That they can't be depended on. You might be very happy today. A week from now, you might be very downcast because you're losing that which you had accumulated and hoped that this would bring you joy. But the only true joy for the Lord's people is the doing of the Father's will and having his love, his favor, his blessing, and to realize that we can come to him with all of our cares and problems and that he will bless and direct in everything. Problems in the world seem to be getting more distressing. They seem to be affecting every segment of society today. And the outlook for, looks very ominous. And yet, we, instead of looking at the 
problems, the clouds, the dark clouds that are enveloping all nations, we by faith can look beyond the present. Look to the time when, by faith, realize our own reward. Be with him and see him as he is. And even look further into the future to see the world of mankind brought up from the grave, brought up to human perfection in full harmony with their creator, in a perfect environment, in peace and joy and happiness throughout all eternity. The prospect is glorious if we properly appreciate that which the Lord has given to us and if we try by his grace to be more faithful in doing that which would be pleasing to him. And may the Lord add his blessing.